Hi, this is Exponential Wisdom. This is Dan Sullivan, and I'm here with Peter Diamandis. And the subject today is probably something that everybody thinks about more and more because of developments in the world, and that is artificial intelligence. And Peter, we just had a four-dimensional presentation, actually, because it was so useful at Abundance 360, and it related to a man who is in charge of one of the most powerful current devices with artificial intelligence in the world. So just introduce who our guest was and what the technology is. As one of our Convergence Catalyzer subjects this year at A360 2016, we took a deep dive into artificial intelligence, and I invited Stephen Gold. Stephen has uh, become a very dear friend, and he is the chief marketing officer, the VP of business development, the head of the ecosystem, runs a $100 million venture fund at IBM Watson. And IBM Watson really has done an amazing job at making AI user-friendly and meaningfully usable to entrepreneurs and to companies. That's their purpose, to make AI usable for product development. And other convergence catalyzers, we asked Stephen to please tell us what's the top five recent developments that have occurred that were significant in the AI field. And then looking forward, what do you expect is the top five over the next three years? So I've got these in front of me, Dan, and I think you do too. We'll, let's talk about the recent developments. And the first one he brought up, I think appropriately so, was IBM Watson winning the game of Jeopardy. And this is late 2011. Mm -hmm. So it was, I like to call it a Netscape moment, sort of the breaking of the four minute mile. It was a very visible gut level, like, wow, I had no idea AI could do that. Right. I mean, you've seen the videos along with me a couple yeah. of times. Pretty impressive. The thing about it is that Jeopardy really, really depends upon thought association that, first of all, I can't match any of the human people on Jeopardy. <laughs> I mean, they're so quick and they these are people who obviously didn't get dates when they were teenagers because they, you know, <laughs> they were they were just consuming encyclopedias and everything like that. But what you began to see, and I think why it was a crossover moment, Peter, is that this isn't just linear type thinking on the part of the computer. This is actually multidimensional association based on things that we associate with as human creativity. And to give people a little bit of a knowledge, IBM Watson machine back in 2011 had some 3,000 Power 7 processor cores. It could read a million books per second. It was the size of a small conference room. And it had downloaded Wikipedia and was not hooked up to the internet, but it could process all of its contextual data. IBM calls this cognitive computing. And that was so four years ago. Today, IBM Watson is the size of three pizza boxes, three blade servers, <laughs> and it's been put on the cloud. And pretty impressive. So the second thing that Stephen said is the recent developments that he finds most exciting was really the human machine interface and speech recognition that we've seen with Siri and Google now. Mm -hmm. You can talk to your phone and most of the time, you know, it understands and gives you a useful answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, what's the name of the Amazon, the tower? The Oh, Echo, the Amazon the Echo. Echo. You know, that, I mean, I found that amazing when I first saw it. We were giving it out as Christmas gifts this year. It was hard to set it up in Canada. They don't have quite the backup for it. But, you know, it was really amazing. You just talk at this little thing that's on your desk. I find the voice coming back is an uh, intimate voice. It's a knowledgeable voice. You don't have a robotic feeling to it at all. And uh, very quick thinking, putting things together. Siri, a lot of times, says, well, to find this out, go to this source. This one doesn't. This one actually gives you an answer. Yeah, it really, really powerful stuff. You can see, you know, in the future, talking to your car, you know, you're saying, how are you feeling today? Well, you know, there's a few things that I think should be looked at here. 
Yeah, my tires are kind of oh, low. My tires, you, you know, I'm, I'm just time. feeling a little saggy on the left hand side here. Could you? <laughs> could, <laughs> so, I mean, that again goes back to the sensor networks that we were talking about first. But the, this is why it's intimately connected with artificial intelligence because those sensors are either alert, curious, responsive, or, and resourceful, or they're not, depending upon the artificial intelligence yep. that interprets the messages. Absolutely. The third area that Stephen flagged as a major recent breakthrough, and 100% agree with him, is what's called deep learning. Deep learning is a process that mimics the brain and has effectively these layers of neural nets. And deep learning is something which is a computer that's able to learn very much in the way that the brain learns. And it's been applied a multitude of different ways. We see deep learning as the underlying driver for Google Photos that can, I love Google Photos. It takes all the photos I take on my iPhone or my Android phone, and it categorizes them by people, by location, by what is context, what it's seeing. Is this on a plane? Is it in a boat? Is that a dog? Is it a car? What is it? So deep learning is actually not a person programming a computer, this is a cat. It's a computer learning on its own. These are the parameters that make something a cat. And so deep learning is coming on strong in a huge way. Peter, we're going to be the beneficiary, Babs and I, of this because we're going to human longevity just in a few days. And when we were talking to Craig Venter and then the wonderful presentation given by the medical director at Abundance 360, and Stephen Palter, you know, our great IVF doctor in the United States, was saying why he was so excited about HLI was he says when they have a million genomes tested, he says then they have deep learning technology. They'll be just able to see amazing number of associations with genetic relationships and everything else. is isn't going to be human beings figuring that out. This is going to be very powerful AI that's going to be seeing the patterns. Yeah. And then it's going to be feeding right back to your specific prognosis, medical, plan, medical you plan, know, and everything yeah. like that. So there's just so many things that are going to happen in that field and every other area of activity on the planet because just the crunching numbers with artificial intelligence, the power of the hardware, but also these amazing artificial intelligence programs. They'll figure out storms. They'll figure out weather patterns, terrorism. Terrorism, global warming. I mean, it's a tool that is going to help us take on, and we'll, we'll talk mm -hmm. about it in a little bit. Another fun idea for a podcast will be after you go through mm -hmm. the health nucleus, I've gone through it myself. Let's talk about oh, yeah. the future of healthcare and what we're experiencing there. Yeah, we're so excited about that. The next thing that Stephen flagged was, we talked about this a little bit, but image recognition and analysis now rivals humans, right? So if you show a bunch of photographs, the ability of deep learning and AI to look at that photograph and say, oh, that's a horse-drawn carriage in Central Park in New York. It looks like it's a winter day. And describe a scene and a setting is powerful because where that goes next is into medical diagnostics, right? Mm -hmm. Look at an x-ray of a lung or more importantly, an MRI of your body and being able to say, aha, that looks like a problem. Let's dig in deeper. Mm -hmm. What is learned in one industry with the application of AI immediately crosses all the boundaries into other areas of knowledge. There's this amazing cross-fertilization that takes place when people see something, a breakthrough now in one area of learning automatically goes across the border. The final thing he said is, finally, there is an uptake and a resurgence in universities teaching AI curriculum. So one of the most recent benefits in this field has been you can now find machine learning, data mining, AI curriculum in almost every university. And if you're in high school or college, if you're not thinking about that as a subject for learning, you've been asleep. I've got a question about this. You're four and a half year olds. These are pretty favored kids given who comes home with <laughs> knowledge in their heads. But how do you think about that? I mean, they're going to be in tune with everything that you're discovering because you're going to tell them about it. And you're laying the groundwork for a lot of their learning, a lot of their development as they go forward. 
How do you keep it normal for them? How do they remain really, really normal kids with all this? They're being plugged into the front. Ask me in 10 years. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe it still works that you're only a hero until they're 10 years old. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, there's dad again. (laughs) I watch them use AI all the time in the following sense. And I struggle with this because the question becomes how much screen time should they have? How much tablet time should they have? And the old adage is, oh, you have to limit that and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, going forward, the individuals who've got the most level of intimate knowledge with these computational systems, the interface systems, are going to be the most successful. So I'll just give one example. And my jury is still out on this, but they use YouTube for kids on their tablet. And what they'll do is they'll go and they'll click on the little microphone button and One of my sons will say, robots flying through space. And of course, an AI is listening to your voice, coming up with the search, and then finding all videos of robots flying through space, and they'll click on what they want. And so there's this interaction with the world that they have that whatever they're interested in, they ask about it, and all of a sudden it's there Mm -hmm. instantly in high definition. So. This is faster than the Encyclopedia Britannica that I oh, that I with photos. No, I and used videos. to surf. I used to surf the Encyclopedia Britannica when I was ten years old. It didn't move as fast as this. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at what Stephen Gold was excited about over the next three years, two thousand sixteen to eighteen. The first is he said his expectation is in the next three years, an AI system will beat the Turing test, and that we will start to negotiate international treaties regarding the use of AI. Interesting conversation around that. Yeah, well, the Turing, if I remember correctly, is where you were interacting actually with a AI system and you couldn't tell that it wasn't human. Isn't that part of it? Yeah, it was. this goes back to the like 50s where Turing was an expert in machine systems, early computers. And he said, in the future... We're going to get to a point where we can't actually tell the difference between computers and humans. And the way he said is, if you're sitting on one side of a teletype, you got to put it back in the mindset, right? A teletype. And you're typing to an entity on the other side that you cannot see. And if you're typing and they're answering and you can't tell whether they are a human or a computer, that passes the Turing test. Yeah. And of course, today, probably what's on the other side is actually talking to you and you can't tell even by their voice inflection that they're not. Well, we have chatbots right now that actually are pretty powerful. The second thing he said is that all five human senses, sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch, will become a normal part of our computing experience. That's a pretty cool idea. Well, the touch one, I find quite amazing. How do you actually do that? In other words, if I understand Philip Rosedale, who we'll deal with on another podcast, the VR, virtual reality, augmented reality, but I was deeply interested in that. And we've been talking to Philip about having strategic coach workshops in the future where, you know, a thousand people from around the world are actually participating in a strategic coach workshop. They actually feel like they're there. And they can actually shake hands with other people that they know, but they're in their home in Mumbai or they're in Sydney, Australia. Or, in, or L.A. and not traveling to Chicago. <laughs> or L.A. and Venice Beach. I mean, that would be pretty wild, but there you go. But we know that we have to start thinking about it right now because there's a huge sacrifice. I mean, in marketing, there's a notion of a sacrifice, and the sacrifice is travel time and everything to get to coach. And there is something that I'm not sold yet that you can replace the human in the room experience. We're charging good money for this, but for someone from India, for maybe $1,000, they can actually participate in a workshop. And then you're not limited by scale. I say 1,000 people, maybe it's a million people. Well, this is the 60s, right? We're all of a sudden dematerializing your workshops, you're demonetizing it, meaning the price is coming down, and then you're democratizing it. So a million people, not just hundreds or thousands of people. And this is where we're going. I talk about this at Abundance 360, the same thing. I mean, eventually over this 25-year journey I'm on, we're going to dematerialize and demonetize and democratize A360. I know this year, for the first time, we started 
experimenting with a live broadcast of A360 for yeah. people who got snowed out. And we're going to make it available to a certain number of people who can watch it live, but participate through like the Zedings platform or yeah. Beam Robots. Yeah, I mean, I was talking to Dean Jackson, you know, Dean, and he said he loved it. He was in Orlando. He couldn't free up that particular weekend. He knew that six months ago, but he said, I I was there, and he said, I loved it. I loved every part of it. He was on A360 digitally. But he was doing live streaming, yeah. and so we're already moving down in that direction. I'm thinking about you and I, essentially, with this podcast, have our own radio station that costs virtually nothing to actually produce these I'm looking at Willard, my uh, sound engineer, because <laughs> uh, he's saying nothing. You know, that's what it feels like. <laughs> anyway, so the thing here is that we're already experimenting. There's an enormous amount of computing power that's even allowing us to do this. We're watching each other on Skype. We both are in our own studios. This is all being recorded. Files will be sent in a few minutes. They'll be edited together, and then they'll be sent out online. Well, you're dematerializing the whole process. Yeah, this would have cost huge capital assets of NBC or ABC 30 years ago. This would have taken an entire billion-dollar corporation to make happen. Oh, yeah. And we think of it just like, oh, instantly, and it all works, and it's perfect, and it's simple. Now it's the quality of the ideas and conversation, not the equipment and the tech around it that matters. Yeah, and it's sort of the spontaneity and the non-scripted part of it. You and I, I remember we really prepared enormously for about two minutes before we, <laughs> you know, before we started doing our podcast, but we do have themes to run on. But this dematerialization is such a fantastic thing. The big thing about equality, you know, there's a lot of discussion about equality just because of the way economics are rolling out these days. But the real problem of inequality is inequality of opportunity. It's not the inequality of mm -hmm. outcomes. It's the inequality of opportunity. The world will want everybody to be able to plug in. And the reason is it's to everybody's advantage to have 8 billion, 9 billion people plugging yeah. in. The more minds focusing on solving problems, the better, right? And there's this interesting notion, and the same thing at human longevity, the more genomes we have sequenced, the more everyone benefits. You know, it's yeah. scale. The more people using Google or Amazon, the cheaper things are. All of these impacts of scale are so important. Mm -hmm. So number three on Stephen Gold's anticipated future breakthroughs in AI was that AI and cognitive computing will tackle society's most daunting challenges, terrorism, global mm -hmm. climate change, bringing exabytes of data into perspective. And that's a really important point because people fear the future and they fear these technologies mm -hmm. because again, Hollywood has this dystopian view, but this notion of radical transparency because of sensors and networks, IoT we talked about just in our last podcast, now linked with AI means that it's really hard to do evil in the planet because you are leaving digital breadcrumbs, even if you don't think you are. Mm -hmm. And the ability for AI to look at the data and identify terrorism cells or the ability of AI to look at what's going on on climate crisis, or AI to help come up with drought-resistant crops, or AI to come up with new approaches for reducing CO2 emissions out of smokestacks. I mean, mm -hmm. these are the tools that will allow us to take on the world's biggest problems with more power than ever before. The thing that I appreciate so much about the opportunity that you've given us with the longevity thing is early warning. A lot of our worst crises on the planet is that we didn't get early warning. I was talking about severe storms. Hardly anybody dies in the United States anymore from severe storms. The reason is that the power of the climate technology, the forecasting, the weather forecasting now, gives people enormous amount of early warning that they can make arrangements. Very few people get caught by surprise. Actually, I show this chart of deaths from natural catastrophes, and it's this plummeting that takes place because we have satellite assets, we have sensor networks, and we can actually tell people there's a tsunami coming or there is a monsoon coming. 
And it's amazing, They're just plummeting in the number of losses of life over the last 50 years. Well, I'll give you a real example of that. You know, 9-11, the entire country knew about it as it was happening. And I remember a long time ago, my mother talking about Pearl Harbor, which was 1941. And she lived in a farmhouse, you know, about 10 miles from a community. They didn't have a phone. And she said it wasn't for three days that they knew about Pearl Harbor. She said she was so surprised when she found out about it. And I don't think that she was necessarily unusual in 1941. Amazing. Which, by the way, goes back to the notion that the news media carries all this negative news. And anyway, I won't start in that bandwagon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, this is like red meat. I can <laughs> feed you red. <laughs> so number four on his list was that AI and cognitive computing will leverage all available health data, genomics, exogenous data, social, medical, phenotypic data, and redefine the practice of medicine. And of course, we've been talking mm -hmm. about that. That's what HLI is doing. We have a 40-person machine learning team up in Mountain View. And it's the more comprehensive medical data, we're going to take you and Babs into our system. We're going to digitize you, right? We're going to sequence all 3.2 billion letters of your life, all of your microbiome in your gut. We're going to look at the 2,400 chemicals in your bloodstream, high resolution body MRI, brain MRI, all of that stuff. And then all that data gets looked at in context to hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of genomes. And we can now understand and predict this is what you're likely to come down with. Let's look for it and stop it before yeah. it, it hurts you. That to me is gold. This fact of catching things early. You know, we do extensive blood work already. I, Babs and I do full blood work every quarter with Tom Incladon in Scottsdale. Yep. He's caught about 15 things that if they had been going for another three or four years, but that's Tom just getting the blood test back from the various labs. We're talking about incomparably more powerful, comprehensive artificial intelligence here that's looking at these indicators and not only comparing us against our past life, they're comparing us against everybody else's past life. Yeah. So the next thing that Stephen talks about is rise of the neuromorphic chip. Think of it as a computer chip that has architecture that looks much more like the brain. So it's about how do you put artificial intelligence into everything? And I remember this phenomenal talk I was listened to between two CEOs of major tech companies. I won't mention the names. It was about a few months ago. And the comment they were saying is, yes, everything is going to become smart. Everything. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start to see, you know, little brains in everything that's got electricity running through it. And that's just us outside of ourselves. Yeah. People get so scared about this. And I said, we've already been doing this for centuries with other kinds of machines. You know, we've taken our body and extended it outside of ourselves with powerful engines and factories and everything else. That's just us outside of ourselves. And the artificial intelligence is just us outside of ourselves. So the final thing, and I think it is at this point kind of obvious, but that AI and cognitive will be woven into every fabric of our lives. And the way I describe this is we're going to be living in a world in which AI is going to be listening to our conversations, watching what we're doing, imbued and embedded in everything, and it's going to make everything just more capable. You can see why the educational system has some work cut out <laughs> for it, Peter. I mean, the whole notion, I think, of education system is a bankrupt notion. There actually is no education system. There's just a vast amount of educational resources and capabilities. Education is actually going to be a guide to which resources and capabilities people should tap into. Yeah. I mean, it's like Khan Academy. I mean, it's... I've gone through the algebra course at Khan Academy. He's just the greatest math teacher I've ever experienced in my life. And there are millions of Salman Khans on the planet who are smart about something. And this can be the faculty for the entire world. And it's going to be available to every kid. I like to say what AI is going to do is democratize, demonetize, dematerialize teaching and healthcare. And I go on to say the child of a billionaire and the child of the poorest 
man in Mumbai will have access to the same teaching. Mm -hmm. The best teachers will be free because of AI. The best physicians will be free. The same way that Google for Larry Page as a search engine and Google for a kid in Mumbai is identical. Yeah. I mean, if you take the costs out of education and healthcare, life is really, really inexpensive. <laughs> yeah. We didn't talk about what my friends at Uber are doing, heading towards an autonomous Uber, and all of a sudden it's 10 times cheaper to use autonomous Ubers all the time than owning a car. So we're demonetizing living Yes, in so many ways. Yeah. Well, buddy, I always love our time together here. How about next time we pick up with a field that I'm thrilled about, a field that has seen $5 billion of investment in the last 18 to 24 months and is going to see double that again next year, and that's the field of augmented and virtual reality. Oh, yeah. I think there's no experience that people have when they go to Abundance 360 or Singularity University that I think supercharges your brain more than what's possible with virtual and augmented reality. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. It's going to change every aspect of our lives, how we learn, how we teach our kids, how we govern, how we interface in marketing, our travel, our adventures. And it's not like 10 years from now. The inflection point is right now. And we'll be uh, hearing the wisdom of Philip Rosedale, the inventor of Second Life and a great friend and very proud to be one of his advisors. Anyway, more on VR and AR in our next session. Great pleasure, Peter. My mind jumps a level after we do our podcast, so I really appreciate it. Take care, my friend. See you soon. Bye.